All right, so we're going to move right along to our next panel about educational technology and the future of knowledge. So our moderator is going to be the one and only Igor Shoifot. Um, so Igor is an entrepreneur and investor. He has co-founded 10 startups, including Fotki, uh, which is one of the world's largest photo sharing sites. He works with TMT Investments in San Francisco, as you already heard. And he's adjunct uh, faculty at UC Berkeley. He holds bachelor's, master's, and PhDs in history and an MBA from Boston University. Um, uh, we have uh, an interesting mix here of uh, people from um, the US and people from Ukraine. So I'm gonna have uh, several questions and uh, some of you are just perfectly in time for the beginning of the panel. Um, what we're gonna do first, since we only have 30 minutes, is I'm going to let my guests introduce themselves real quick, uh, probably starting with you. <laughs> with Julie, and uh, then after that I'll introduce myself, and then uh, I will start this discussion with a couple of uh, questions, and then uh, I guess, you know, we'll, we'll just have a free discussion, so, so okay. Julie. Well, hello everyone, it's such an honor to be here, and um, my name is Julie Shapiro, I work at the Haas School of Business at the University of California Berkeley campus. And um, I will be talking to you a little bit later about um, a very exciting partnership I have with a Ukrainian university. Um, but I work in the executive education department of the Haas School of Business. And what we do is deliver short programs for executives and um, people from university, executive MBA students about innovation, entrepreneurship, leadership, marketing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I'll be talking to you a little bit about some things that I think would be useful for, um, to bring to the Ukraine. Awesome. Thank you very much. Hello. My name is Roman Khmil, and um, I'm a computer science engineer by training. And I worked uh, as a programmer, then built a couple outsourcing companies in Ukraine. And recently moved into the educational field. Uh, we feel that we do need to train more people and we do need uh, to drastically raise quality of education in Ukraine. So I represent here Brain Basket Foundation, which is a fund uh, facilitating uh, training of IT people in Ukraine. Hello, I'm Viktor Golasiuk, board member of Bionic University and advisor to the Minister of Education and Science of Ukraine and the president of the Association for Innovation Development of Ukraine. Hi, I'm Yuri Paraschak. For 34 years, I was at IBM Research at the Watson Lab. Five years spent driving the Smarter Cities job. I've been at Carnegie Mellon for six months. I'm just trying to figure my way around it. And the only reason I'm on this panel is because I wanted a free ticket. <laughs> That's all? No, no other freebies? No other Just freebies. a ticket? I'm Burton Lee. I lecture on European entrepreneurship and innovation at Stanford. Uh, we're going into year seven of our course starting next January. I'm going to say a few comments about MOOCs in Europe versus Silicon Valley, uh, how to use higher education to uh, defend and save Ukraine, and basically what the role of higher education, education is, but also training, of, so corporate training, uh, where that stands in innovation today. Uh, I'm very happy to be here. My name is Pamela Egan. I'm a senior research fellow at the Berkeley Center for Law, Business, and the Economy. Um, I'm here because Igor charmed me into showing up. <laughs> um, I'm a lawyer by training. I'm not an academic. And I'm going to touch very lightly on the importance of the rule of law and how important I think it is for students to study the rule of law. Hi, I'm uh, Paul Bigler. The only reason I'm here is Roman Kizik said that I should come. Um, but my background is predominantly in finance. I have worked and lived Middle East, Africa, uh, basically all over the world, and I have using a current term, I have pivoted more recently into education investments, uh, in particular the area of, as Burton was just bringing up, MOOCs and the importance of MOOCs and alternative types of education. Thank you very much, everybody. So as you see, it's a pretty illustrious uh, panel and um, uh, I, uh, 
my name is Igor, and uh, I'm chairman of the board of a uh, uh, really great incubator called Happy Farm, and you see Anna there, who's the CEO, and my partner and, and close friend. I'm also a venture capitalist at TMT Investments, and I also uh, teach at Berkeley. <laughs> uh, so, so. I feel outnumbered. Well, but uh, you're going to have me at Stanford pretty soon. So. <laughs> um, anyway, so uh, we're going to have um, really a short panel, uh, and uh, I'm going to try to have a discussion, and, and I'm going to have you guys start probably with Burton so that you will come back to me. Uh, let me pose this one big question. There are uh, two categories of people, people uh, who, uh, in this panel, people who work in education in the West, so to say, and uh, people coming from Ukraine. So can I uh, post, how about if I pose this question to you guys? For those of you who are in the West, what do you think, since you know a thing or two about education, um, and since the subject of the conference is Ukraine, what do you think would be the main recommendation? What would be your general feeling? Uh, what should Ukraine do to prepare itself the best to be competitive, to, to have, what, what sort of stuff should, uh, should Ukraine do in education? And to the guests coming from Ukraine, uh, the same question to you, what are you guys planning to do? What is Ukraine going to be like uh, in the future? What sort of education will it be? What sort of educational initiatives do you have? So let's, let's start with Burton and come back to me. So b before I give my comments, uh, just to give some initial background, I spent a lot of time in Europe working with the European Commission. Uh, last two years I've been a visiting professor inside Riga Technical University, two German universities, Trinity College Dublin. Uh, part of what I do is I study the European higher education scene, uh, work with corporates as well as governments and universities. So I will share with you what my recommendations to the Latvians has been, which I think is very applicable for Ukraine. Uh, I believe, so just Quick memory, 1983, do you remember the invasion of Grenada? Why did the Americans go to Grenada? American medical students studying, large numbers of them. If Ukraine wants to defend itself against Russia for the long term, you need to put very large numbers of American, German, British, Japanese, Korean, what have you, students studying at Ukrainian universities. How do you do that? You make English the first language, you basically uh, either force early retirement or pay, retire pay for early retirement of the older generation professors. So you bring in a whole new generation of new young professors, not Ukrainian necessarily, but from across Europe, US. You completely internationalize the university system, whether it's in Kiev, Kharkov, Lvov. You, you also simultaneously raise the level of the education today, education system in Ukrainian higher education. You're also going to by doing that, by bringing in new professors and students, you're going to dramatically increase the number of startups being spun out of Ukrainian universities. That, I believe, uh, rather than, and th this, do not think that your language will be your main defense. So I'm a strong Ukrainian nationalist and Latvian na nationalist myself. But your language also isolates you. Put English as the first language inside your universities like the Finns have done. That is what will defend you. If there are 5,000 Americans and Germans and Brits studying at Ukrainian universities 10 years from now, guess what? American tanks will roll, and American aid and German and British aid will roll as well. It's radical, but Ukraine has its back against the wall, and this is what I believe is needed. Burton, I think that was very insightful. Um, I think there's another macro effect that's going on today that's related to the number of PhDs that are being generated around the world. If you look at the gross enrollment ratio, it's going up to about 40%. That's the percentage of students that end up going to a certain level, uh, in this case, PhD, around the world. In the US, there's about 60,000 PhDs generated every year. China's raising its numbers at ridiculous rates. Uh, they're almost matching the US. It, uh, you can dis discuss which numbers are, are accurate. In India, they generate between, what, three to 600 PhDs a year, which is remarkable given the size of the country. At the same time, the economies of these countries are gonna need, for example, in India, to generate something like, oh, 30,000 colleges and about 800 new universities to follow what is the expected demand. 
At the same time, however, the number of PhDs that are out of jobs is rising dramatically. What they're being paid is dropping. And it's almost economically better, and, uh, unless you want to be in academia, to have a master's degree and go straight into a job than to take a PhD. Now, there are many exceptions to that, but I've just painted this at a gross level. So I, I follow what Burton says. First of all, move a new set of um, educators into the business. Have them speak both uh, English as a first language and Ukrainian. Have them focus on what's needed. For example, look at how education and how the world's changed, right? For example, at the beginning, when IBM was in the computer business, uh, in the 70s, 70% 70 of the business was IBM. So we started computer science. There was a big focus on material science because people were building products. What's happening today? People are thinking about brains, about cognition. Where are the tools to build these cognitive systems? They're not there. There's so much effort that could be put into those areas. Now, you don't want to push the old people out because they have a lot of experience because young people don't have a broad view. They don't know how to connect the dots. You need to have the older people who know what they're doing. But at the same time, you need to move into a place, Ukraine should move into a place where there is demand and not just focus on the academic principles of let's build another uh, engineering school. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you for your recommendations. We will consider it for sure. <laughs> it's, 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 I'm, I'm serious because making English uh, like a working language, it's, it's a, it sounds like radical, but it's quite realistic. It, it, uh, because if we want to turn education uh, as a, from like social ballast to core of the strong economy and strong nation, we have no choice. We should move this way instead of any uh, arguments. Uh, the plan is very simple, but it's hard to implement it, but we are on the track. The plan is to considerably increase the level of uh, education in Ukraine on the one hand, and on the uh, other hand is to create a very strong investment stimulus for international and national uh, investors in Ukraine. Because if we only succeed with first part, uh, we will have a huge brain drain. And actually we are, we are seeing this situation currently. And if we only create a strong investment stimulus, we will only uh, like scale our old, outdated raw material economy, which we currently have. So we, we have no choice. We should address uh, both uh, these uh, issues. And as for the first issue, we have considerable uh, successes because uh, due to the adoption of new law of higher education, uh, which, was, which was newly adopted, uh, we uh, laid the new foundation for the, for, for the new education system of Ukraine. It gives more autonomy to the universities. It uh, sticks uh, um, universities to industrial needs, which is very important. The, it makes... Uh, university is more market oriented and uh, they have uh, more stimulus for uh, their development and also um, the corporate sector have real influence on the curricula as well as uh, uh, control of uh, control of the quality of education but it is only the first step but it is a result of uh, uh, of a bold uh, work of uh, team uh, of uh, Minister Sergei Kvit of uh, Lilia Granevich as a head of uh, Parliament Committee in Ukraine. And uh, this is very important and uh, this reform is currently on track. But uh, the other part, we should uh, uh, address it very directly and uh, we shouldn't have any compromise in this to set a strong investment stimulus for intellectual based uh, industries and to say that, uh, that uh, the government shouldn't address uh, for example, raw material business and uh, intellectual uh, based business with the same stimulus. It's, uh, it's obviously. Uh, that's why we have united uh, over 20 leading uh, international, national uh, and national high-tech companies in Ukraine in order to create in Ukraine, to lobby in Ukraine the best conditions for running uh, high-tech business and uh, new industrial uh, business. 
uh, in, in Ukraine. And as for uh, very concrete steps, I would like uh, uh, just to mention one of our uh, new, new, new initiatives. It's a joint uh, program of uh, Bionic University and the Center of Executive Education at uh, Haas Business School and University of Berkeley, which is uh, called uh, the Innovation Management and Entrepreneurship. And I think that J Julie will um, uh, tell a little uh, bit more about this. But the idea is very simple. We should nurture Ukrainian entrepreneurs and Ukrainian innovation managers because we cannot just deal with raw material economy. And, uh, and I totally agree with Yuri Panchul that uh, the building a strong economy is, is a core of strong nation and we shouldn't blame uh, anyone ever think if if he's very bad and says that he, it's because of he it's because of our weakness and our weaknesses because of lack of our consolidation and lack of proper governmental policy so we should address these issues very uh, directly thank you very much um. I've spent previous 10 years on the business side, uh, building IT companies, and 10 years ago, the largest one in Ukraine was 200 people. And uh, the educational system was producing roughly 15,000 people a year in, in IT. Definitely not all of them were quality people, maybe half of those uh, ended up in the industry, but uh, that was the scale, and uh, the educational system was kind of sufficient. Industry enjoyed 30 to 40 percent growth year over year ever since then, riding on the outsourcing wave. And um, over the last couple of years, uh, we've reached uh, 3,000 people in top five companies in Ukraine, and it's scaling further. So companies uh, figured that now not sales is a critical component of their business, but rather recruitment became uh, the bottleneck. And it's obvious uh, that uh, we don't have any people unemployed, and now any sizable deal which uh, uh, Ukrainian companies uh, tender for, like if IBM comes with 1,000 people or 500 people, we lose because uh, it all goes to India, which just don't have the scale, and even if Ukrainian company wins, it starts recruiting from its competition, and cost of that uh, is okay for the senior and mature talent, but if junior people cost you the fortune, uh, we just not, cannot compete with India and other destinations. So uh, industry finally realized how critical uh, supply of uh, quality talent is, and Brain Basket is one of the initiatives that's a foundation, non-profit, uh, non-government, which is facilitating um, IT education on the market, and our strategy is to raise as much money as we can and uh, invest and uh, spend those money across Ukraine to facilitate commercial initiatives, various training centers, as well as reform existing educational system, which is huge but very bureaucratic and inefficient. So in my view, um I think the most important thing for Ukraine right now, two things. One is uh, really to l focus on revamping the educational system. And I think a big focus, I, I really liked what you said about, uh, Burton, about internationalizing. That's very important because you've got um, this, this talented pool of people and they, they study and then they end up leaving Ukraine. Um, so you want, it, you want to keep them in Ukraine and also have... Um, jobs and opportunities that will make the economy flourish. So I really think that um, one of the most important things is to um, establish uh, entrepreneurial training as part of the curriculum in all of the universities and maybe even earlier than that. I know that in Silicon Valley they're doing a lot of um, entrepreneurial training um, you know, in high school and, and some, some even before high school, believe it or not. Um, and actually, um, Victor alluded to, uh, we actually are launching a partnership with um, Bionic University, UC Berkeley, and uh, a large portion of that is going to be around entrepreneurial training. At UC Berkeley, um, we actually have a, a professor named Steve Blank, probably many of you have heard of him, who teaches the Lean Launchpad, and it's all about um, how can we, um, it's, it's a way to really uh, teach entrepreneurial training, but experientially. 
And um, I think it was you who mentioned the word pivot. So it's all about coming up with an idea and instead of writing the 50-page business plan, put it into a very simple document and then go out in the field and test it, validate it. Um, in one of our programs that we call the Innovation Core, um, that has the Lean Launchpad methodology at its core, we ask our participants to talk to 100 customers within seven weeks and really make sure that their idea is an idea that will go in the market. And uh, obviously, um, by week by week, they have to post things, and obviously there are a lot of pivots. You know, They start out with one idea, they think their customer base is gonna be here, and then it's there. Uh, but what we found with the training is, um, in the United States, and I'm sure the, the rates are the same in the Ukraine, um, you know, startups fail. A lot of them fail. Uh, usually the success rate is about 18%, but with this kind of training and this methodology, we've seen the, the rates rise to 63%. So it really makes a big difference to have that training. So I think um, definitely having English um, as the, you know, the main language, internationalizing, but also really focusing on um, entrepreneurial training is very important. And also just, um, Within that, studying you know, the clusters of innovation, where are they, what, what makes them work, and figuring out how do you bring that to the Ukraine? What, you know, how do you create the ecosystem of innovation? Um, I know the one in Silicon Valley very well because it's in my backyard, but obviously that's not gonna work in the Ukraine. So, so study all of them and figure out what can we bring to the Ukraine that will really work. And I just want to close to say that, that we're really honored to be launching this program with Bionic Hill and um, working closely with the Ukraine, and we hope we can be part of um, this new revolution. These, these are all very interesting ideas, and uh, again, I'm honored to be able to be on the panel with you and others. Um, I. I have a Russian background. I'm American, but I speak Russian, and I've uh, done business in Russia, and I'm conducting a study in Russia right now with Russian VC regarding laws that impact innovation in Russia. So my perspective is from Russia, and I've spent a lot of time talking with Russians about how they do business and their approach to do business, uh, to business. And it's a very, it's personal. It, it, deals have to be based on individuals because the system doesn't really help one. One must uh, develop a relationship and decide, do I trust this person or not? Because there is not a developed rule of law. And that allows for deals. People have done great deals and they've made money in Russia. But it enormously holds Russia back. It's very difficult for me to convince American investors, this is years ago, this is before we had this crisis, to invest in Russia, um, because they know, well, I'm gonna have to spend time to get to know these people before I can do it. So I, I, I think that one of the best things that, uh, one thing that, the, that Ukraine should do is uh, train lawyers, and, and don't train them just what are the laws, but how do we approach the law? And how do we approach transactions? And uh, an important way of approaching transactions is maintaining transparency. What I just between two people, what is our deal? Let's reflect that deal on these pieces of paper. Um, it's amazing how even in the US sometimes it's hard to get people to do that. Um, and, and what a lawyer does is make everybody feel comfortable to put everything on the table. Let's get everything transparent. Let's work out our differences now rather than just set time bombs all over the place. Um, so um, I, I would, uh, I, you know, I'm not an educational specialist. I don't know the best method for how should the Ukraine do this. I, I think it would be helpful to go to the West and get steeped in uh, a political science degree and then go to law school. Um, and then bring that approach that is taught in these schools to Ukraine and to the way we do deals or 
join the government and bring that approach or become a judge and bring that approach. I think that that, in addition to these other uh, very interesting measures, uh, but I, I think that the rule of law is, is crucial to developing a prosperous, global, dynamic, competitive economy. Yeah. Um, I, I've got a little bit of a different perspective, uh, partially because I came out of the banking world. And in the banking world, you, the first thing you do is say, well, why should I do that? Right? We are extraordinarily risk averse. So the first question is, if I can't come up with a great reason why I should be investing in a certain place or in a certain industry, then it's just really easy to say, well, I'll just go somewhere else. Um, and when we were in the process of looking at starting up a couple of organizations, which we're in the middle of doing, um, we got exposed to the, um, the Ukrainian technology environment. Now, there's 600 and some people here, uh, which in and of itself is astounding to me, uh, that you've got 600 people that are as passionate as I've observed over the course of the day. I mean, that is an extraordinary message that, and when we were talking about messaging earlier today, one of the great messages is that there is an extraordinary passion and fervor and knowledge that exists in the country that probably isn't getting a fair shake. So when we were developing our companies as we are now, we had a lot of places we could go. And given my training, the easy answer was, why Ukraine? Right? Just no. It's just a lot easier to say no and go somewhere else. Well, it's interesting, and, and my colleagues over here from Elex, uh, who we ended up starting to work with, convinced us that the alternative of working with Ukrainian talent far exceeds the alternatives that were available to us elsewhere. Now, with respect to education technology and what Burton and, and my other colleagues have brought up, Ukraine is a technology-savvy center of excellence. And I'm not sure that message outside the 600 and some people in this room is out there to the extent that it should be. This gentleman here was talking about economics and, and how you needed a vibrant economy in Ukraine. It's here. I mean, you are all basically demonstrators of that center of excellence. So as I look at this, A, I'm a supporter because I, instead of saying no, I said yes and I'm happy we're saying yes. But more importantly, I think the message that has to come out of this room is one that we're good at what we do. We know what we do. And actually, we should export to other parts of the world the talents that already exist. Um, everybody, thank you so much for such brilliant suggestions. I, if I may, uh, the only thing, the, the panel is, is so fantastic. And uh, I love it how everybody comes from well, almost everybody comes from slightly different walks of uh, life, and uh, there are educators here, there are business people, there are uh, legal uh, people presented here. But let me try to probably sum up the advices, uh, the, the advice in general that uh, everybody suggested. And I think it might be useful for all of us to sort of participate, not even necessarily in, in the discussion, but maybe sort of participate as a follow-up, also um, catch any of this illustrious ladies and gentlemen <laughs> outside and talk to them about either of those issues. But my feeling is that what was suggested here today, forgive me if I miss anything, was uh, make English language one of the key languages, uh, at least for education, but hopefully also for uh, transacting business in Ukraine. Uh, make the first language. Well, second probably after Ukrainian. No. No, the first? first? All right, well, Burton insists on the first. I, fine. In the, in the universities. Oh, sure, sure, yeah. Uh, make, it, make it the first, the standard language in the universities. Uh, standardize um, the, uh, try to make sure that education is conducted according or as close as possible to the Western standards. 
uh, bring, bring up as many uh, master degrees graduates and PhDs as you can, uh, specializing in the most important and, I suppose, rather commercial areas, be it, you know, electromechanics, be it physics, chemistry, uh, you know, probably analytical psychology, anything, just any sort of walks of life that, that create professionals. Um, create, um, create organizations such as uh, Berkeley, Bionic Hill, uh, hopefully Stanford, something else. <laughs> um, um, make sure that you don't repeat the mistakes uh, being made in Russia and the situation that unfortunately still exists in Ukraine as well, where rule of law is one thing, but still agreements are done and business is conducted according to what, what uh, the, the Russian word, and I don't know, the Ukrainian equivalent is panyatia. Uh, which I'll have to translate to you, but Pamela knows. Pachelavetsky, yeah, exactly. Which, which definitely hurts uh, business a lot, right? In, in Pamela's significant experience in former Soviet Union. Um, and also, from, from what I heard, also make sure that you let the world know, just bring the message out that Ukraine is not a third world country. It actually is a country with brilliant education, not as probably in some respects you still need to build some things up, but with brilliant engineers, brilliant uh, um, uh, marketeers, brilliant entrepreneurs, and I think all of us should work really hard, the people present in this hall and the people outside there should really work really hard to make sure that Ukraine will be successful. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you very much for Thank participating you. in the panel.